Welcome to this last segment of the day. I'm Nancy Laramé, Partnership Director at Tivado. Our guest speaker will be introduced by our Scientific Director, Yeshua Benjo. In order to maximize the outputs of this last segment, we invite everyone to use the chat functionality to ask questions that will be compiled throughout the conference. I will have the pleasure to moderate this Q&A period and ask a number of these questions to Professor Rudin at the end of the segment. Without further ado, I would like to invite a worldwide expert in AI, a researcher that is taking advantage of multidisciplinary to favor drug discovery, save our planet, and also make a better world. Please welcome Professor Joshua Benjo. Thank you. Thank you, Nancy. Thanks for everyone for being here for uh, this event. Um, it gives me a great pleasure to introduce Cynthia Rudin uh, today. She's a well-known computer scientist and statistician uh, with uh, exciting contributions to machine learning that she's going to tell us about, in particular in an area um that i think we need much more work on and that is interpretable machine learning in other words uh there's been uh, a lot of progress in machine learning in the last few years but uh, a lot of it has been with systems that are hard to interpret uh it's hard to know um uh, why they take a decision and this is different from human beings that to some extent are able to explain uh, their decisions she is in particular interested in something I care a lot about, that is the application of machine learning in areas of uh, uh, social good and, and um, uh, healthcare. She um, is the director of the Interpretable Machine Learning Lab at Duke University. She is a professor of computer science, electrical and computer engineering, statistical science, biostatistics, and bioinformatics. And she won several prizes, such as uh, recently the Guggenheim Fellowship and remarkably, the $1 million Squirrel AI Award for AI for the benefit of humanity from the AAAI uh, organization for her work on the importance of transparency in AI systems in high-risk domains, which is going to be the subject of her presentation. She's also a fellow of the American Statistical Association and the Institute of Mathematical Statistics. Um, she's been nominated for her contributions to interpretable machine learning algorithms, prediction in large-scale medical databases, and theoretical properties of ranking algorithms. On that, um, um, Cynthia, um, the floor is yours. Thank you. Okay, so my talk is called um, Stop Explaining black box machine learning models for high stakes decisions and use interpretable models instead. And there it is. Okay, great. So um, I wanna point out that um, there are bad things happening now, right? There are bad bail and parole decisions. They're being made because people um, type in the wrong uh, number into a black box model and it's letting dangerous people go free and it's keeping people in prison who don't deserve to be there. We also have algorithms that are being used in medicine right now, where the algorithms are depending on information that they shouldn't be depending on, like words in an image rather than the actual medical content of the image. We also have um, bad credit and loan decisions being made on faulty information. And I claim that um, explainable machine learning is actually perpetuating this problem. Now, I wanna make a distinction between explainable machine learning and interpretable machine learning. Now, in interpretable machine learning, an interpretable machine learning model obeys a domain-specific set of constraints that makes its computations easier to understand. So in other words, interpretable machine learning is when you use a model that is not a black box, and that's you know, different than explainable machine learning, which is when you use a black box and then try to explain what it did afterward, like post hoc. So in explainable machine learning, you typically start with a black box and then you take another model, like an explanation model that either approximates it or you might compute derivatives of the black box 
or you might visualize what part of the input the model is paying attention to. You basically make an excuse for why this black box is okay to use for this um, application. So um, now, why is it that these two things are very different? I mean, unfortunately, they even almost have the same name, like interpretable, explainable, they sound almost the same. So a lot of people have trouble figuring out why there's such a chasm between these two things. Well, first of all, um, the reason for this chasm, so I'll tell you the, the interpretable machine learning side. So that side says, well, you know what? We don't need black box models in the first place for these applications. So for a lot of these things, you can just use an interpretable model directly. You're not gonna lose any accuracy. And then also you have this issue that explanation methods lend authority to the black box and they tend to have flawed explanations. So um, I put this slide up a minute ago, but I wanna get back to this. So in this article, um, this is an article about a guy called Glenn Rodriguez and he was denied parole because his compass score was miscalculated and compass is a black box proprietary model that's used across the US justice system. And um, he only found out that his score was miscalculated when he compared his score sheet to someone else's and realized that there was a typo in the um, in the inputs to Compass. And so, um, you know, do, do we really need to have black box models like Compass, right? Do we need to have this situation where he's where a typo causes a, a, someone to be kept in prison for for years? Um, so are, are these types of black box models more accurate? Do, do we really need them? So we used some data from Florida that could tell us exactly how accurate Compass is. So we took the data from Florida, which had the Compass scores, and it also had like a little bit of criminal history information and some demographic information. And we fed that data into the latest um, machine learning method in our lab at the time that the data set came out. And the method is called Corals, which came out in around 2017 when this data set came out. And Corals is an algorithm that produces very small logical models. And it's a very complicated algorithm, but it produces tiny little models. And they're so small that sometimes they fit on the bottom of a PowerPoint slide, like today, <laughs> here, <laughs> it's gonna fit on the bottom of a slide. And the model that it produced from this Florida data looks like this. It says, if you're 19 to 20 years old and you're male, then predict arrest within two years of your compass score calculation. Else, if you're 21 to 22 years old and you have two to three prior offenses, then predict arrest within two years of your compass score calculation. Else, if you have more than three priors, predict arrest, otherwise predict no arrest. And we looked at this model. Um, this is the optimal sparse decision list for predicting arrest, right? We looked at this thing and thought, could this possibly be as accurate as compass? Is that even possible? And as it turns out, it was. So what I'm showing you is results from tenfold cross-validation. So we have different subsets of the, of the um, data that are used for training the model, and then um, the, last, the last fold is used for testing it. And the different colors are just um, um, the different folds. So you can see that even across the different subsets of the data, um, they perform very similarly. And so we thought, okay, um, well, I wonder if it's possible to get more accuracy out of this data set. So we just threw the whole machine learning arsenal at this problem. And what we found was that they all performed about equally accurate. Um, so some of these are models that are so complicated that you wouldn't even be able to write them down on a PowerPoint slide, like you know boosted decision trees or support vector machines with radial basis function kernels or something like that. Like, you know, it just, you know, it just feels to show you that, um, that we can debate about compass all day and whether it's fair and whether you know you can have typos and so on. But the truth is that we just don't seem to need black box models at all for this problem. So um, the more work I've done in this field, the more I'm convinced that for high stakes decisions, there really doesn't seem to be an accuracy interpretability trade off, right? Lots of people think there is, but there's really no scientific evidence for it. So case in point, this image from the DARPA explainable AI BAA. Okay, so this is supposed to indicate that there's an inverse relationship between like learning performance, which is, I guess, accuracy, and then explanation effectiveness, which it's not clear what that is. Um, and so um, it looks like they're trying to show you that this inverse relationship exists. Like if you have a really accurate model, you can't understand it. And if you can really understand it, it's not that accurate. 
The problem with this figure, first of all, is that it doesn't seem to correspond to any real problem. Like, it looks like somebody wrote this figure with a Sharpie trying to illustrate a point, but there's no data set or application behind this. Second of all, it looks like it might have been created by someone running a bunch of different machine learning models on the same data set. It's like a fixed data set with a fixed evaluation metric, but that is not how we do data science. For to do data science, we usually follow a knowledge discovery process like the KDD process here that I have from 1996. And in this process, data mining is just one of the steps. And then you're supposed to, after you do data mining, you're supposed to understand, like interpret or evaluate the results and then use that to feed back into like improving your data processing so that the next iteration of this cycle will be better. And um, so in, in that sense, if you do a process like that, then um, you actually get better accuracy when you understand the results because you can go and improve your data set. So in that case, better learning performance correlates with better explanation effectiveness. So I'm not buying that. And then also, even in real world data sets, the trade-off doesn't actually happen like this. And I'll talk, talk a lot about that later, but usually it's kind of flat. Um, and then also, it's not even clear from this figure whether they were talking about explaining black boxes or designing inherently interpretable models. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's just not, not even clear what they were even doing. Um, uh, by the way, when I was talking a few minutes ago about the trade-off, that it doesn't happen like that, you can think exactly about that compass data set that I showed you a minute ago where it was actually completely flat. All right, now I should, um, you know, provide the, the nuance that goes with this. Um, there's some, there's an important caveat here. So there's really two types of data that we end up dealing with in machine learning. Um, there's problems with tabular data and problems with raw data. And tabular data like naturally have a good representation. Like here is, for example, some healthcare data. Like it looks kind of like that. Um, whereas raw data tends to be, um, you know, images or sound waves or large amounts of text. Now for raw data, the only technique that's working right now is neural networks. And also for these raw data problems, it's not really exactly clear what interpretability would look like. Like you, you, you can't make tiny sparse models or anything like that. You can't depend on like three pixels. You have to think about what interpretability actually means in those domains. But for tabular data, the story is completely different. So for tabular data, as long as you're willing to do some pre-processing of the data, then all the methods tend to have similar performance like what I was showing you with the compass data. And in fact, for tabular data, what that means is that you can get even methods that produce very sparse models like sparse decision trees or scoring systems or models like the, you know, models like the corals model I showed you, which is a type of decision tree. Um, even those methods tend to perform as well as the black boxes for tabular data. So um, while we try to um, understand like what an interpretable neural network looks like, in the meantime, we're going to actually try to take advantage of, you know, it's really provides an opportunity for tabular data to create very, very simple models. So I want to give you an example of a machine learning model that's used for a very high stakes decision making setting. Um, and that is preventing brain damage in critically ill patients. So let's say that you have an aneurysm and it, it bursts. So in other words, you have a brain hemorrhage, you have blood, like a blood explosion in your brain, which I'm showing you with that little blue arrow over there. And so you've got, you know, you, you really, this is, you're really in bad shape at this point. So you go to the hospital, you get surgery, and then you would end up in the intensive care unit where you would have EEG monitors placed all over your head. And those monitors would be detecting for the possibility that you might have a seizure. Now, seizures are common in critically ill patients. About 20% of patients get them. They are very dangerous. They lead to brain damage. They lead to death. And doctors will often do a lot to prevent you from getting a seizure. Like they might even um, use medicine to shut part of your brain off so it won't destroy itself by having a seizure. Now, the only way to detect seizures is, or seizure-like activity is with EEG because these are not uh, seizures that are visible, like the people aren't shaking or anything. This is just inside the patient's brain. They're sub subclinical. So um, since we need to use um, 
uh, EEG to predict seizures, we, we run into this problem, which is that EEG is expensive and limited. There's not enough monitors to go for all the patients who need them, and there's not enough doctors to read those monitors. So um, we really do need to predict these seizures in advance so we know how to, um, we know how to better allocate the EEG monitors. So I worked with neurologists to design a machine learning model called the Two Helps to B score that is small enough that it can fit on a PowerPoint slide, but it's as powerful as our best black box machine learning models for this data set. So this is the Two Helps to B score. Um, and um, it's, okay, so it's called Two Helps to B because it's, 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 you can see it in bold. It's like two H, two H E L P and then two, two, two H E L P S and then two points for the B. Okay, so the doctors can memorize this whole model just by knowing its name. And, you know, I know that it looks like a rule of thumb, but it was not created by doctors. It was created by data fed into a machine learning algorithm. It's actually a machine learning model. It is just as accurate as black box models for this data set. It doesn't force you to trust it like a black box. Doctors can decide whether or not they want to trust it which is, I think, a major benefit of interpretable machine learning models. People can look at them and say, oh, I don't trust it, right? Also, um, doctors can calibrate the score with information that's not in the database. So if a patient has something special about them that cannot be recorded in the database, the doctor can say, oh, you know, I think that's worth about a point, and then use their own clinical judgment for things that aren't in the database. All right, now, as I mentioned, um, this, so this model is, is very tiny, but um, as I mentioned, it's a, there is a database that this model was created from, and that database had quite a lot of different factors, and it had over 70 factors to choose from. And so it was the job of our algorithm to kind of narrow down like which, exactly which factors um, it wanted to use. So it had to solve a, a, a difficult mathematical problem to get that um, model that I showed you, and I've written the model on the slide, uh, the, sorry, the, math, the, the, the optimization problem on the slide that we solved. And I'm, I'm not going to have, I don't have to go through the details of it. I will tell you that there are two uh, terms in the objective. So we try to make the model accurate and risk calibrated using the logistic loss. We try to make the model small using that um, model size term. So that just says, please only choose a small number of factors. And then there's a set of constraints that says, please make the coefficients of my model um, integers between negative 10 and 10. And it happened to choose like 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 2. But it could have chosen any number between negative 10 and 10. Now, if you are an optimization expert, you would immediately recognize that this is a very difficult mixed integer nonlinear program. Um, and so we had to develop a special algorithm to solve this problem. But my point here is that, that this math problem should be a problem of computer scientists or mathematicians and not doctors. So this is, um, you know, this is a problem that we should solve and we shouldn't leave it to the doctors to solve it. Because no human can crunch an entire database and come up with a risk prediction model in their head. Okay, so now after we've solved this, so the patient comes in with their burst aneurysm, their hemorrhage, they go into the Get go to the hospital, they get surgery, they're placed on these EEG monitors, and now the neurologist can look at their EEG and say, oh, this person has this, this, and that. They now have um, a two helps to be score of three. That means they're high risk, so we'll place them on continuous EEG for at least 72 hours and start them on preventative medications for seizures. Now, so far, um, two helps to be has been validated on an independent multicenter cohort. This is not a study that I was involved with, this is done by neurologists. And what I'm showing you is a, a predicted probability of seizure versus true probability of seizure. And so you can, and then also, um, and so you wanna be on the diagonal there, right? And then the original data set that we constructed to helps to be from is in blue. And then the validation study results are in green. So what it's showing you is that this validated very nicely across different hospitals. And so now it's actually able to be used at many different hospitals across um, the United States and across the world. And so far it's resulted in a substantial reduction in the duration of EEG monitoring per patient, so a 63% reduction in the, in the duration of monitoring. And this um, allowed the doctors to um, monitor a huge number more patients, so 2.82 times more patients, 
which allows the doctors to reduce brain damage and save lives. So it's a rare example of a machine learning model that is actually used in a very high stakes decision-making setting. Okay, so I've talked about um, tabular data. And now I wanna switch over to talking about raw data because you know, what's the deal with raw data? We need to use a neural network, but do we have to create a black box and explain it? Or can we actually build constraints into our neural network that allow, will allow us to better understand its reasoning process? So let me first tell you what people are currently doing, and I'll explain to you why that doesn't really work. So um, the, the current um, technique that people are working on is, is called saliency maps. This is, very, this is a very popular type of explanation method. And it just doesn't work very well because you know neural, if neural networks are not actually designed to be interpretable, then they, there's no reason why they naturally should be. So here in this case, it's supposed to give you the explanation as to why this image is classified as a husky. And indeed, right, you know, the network is highlighting the right part of the image that you would, you would expect for <laughs> this being um, a husky, a uh, Siberian husky. But then, you, you, so you think you, you, you believe the network, you might even think you trust it, but then you look at what else the network is doing, right? So this is um, here the network telling us why it classified this image as a musical instrument. Um, and you can see it's clearly not a musical <laughs> instrument. So, um, you know, this is not good, right? This isn't really not good. Um, so, and this is particularly bad for methods like GradCam, which tends to highlight all over the place, even if the network is looking at some specific bit of information in like a medical image. And this is exactly the kind of thing we don't actually, we really don't want in our um, AI models. We wanna be able to, to know what they're doing. So we were wondering if we could build an interpretable deep neural network. So our first attempt at doing this is um, a case-based reasoning model. And it's kind of like k-nearest neighbors, but it actually uses sort of k-nearest parts of, of prototypes, okay? So it reasons about things kind of like the way um, the way Dr. House would reason about, you know, Dr. House is a TV doctor. I don't know if you've seen the show. It's a very funny show. And uh, Dr. House, he comes and he looks at the patients and he says, that patient has a green foot. I've seen a patient with a green foot. You know, that patient had chill blains. So maybe this patient had chill blains. But oh, wait, this patient has like a heart condition. And it's similar to that patient's heart condition. So maybe it's that thing. So that's the kind of way we wanted our network to, to reason. So let me um, show, you, uh, show you how this network is, is reasoning. Um, so here is the network classifying a bird as a clay-colored sparrow. And so what the network is doing is picking out different parts of the bird, and I've highlighted it in different ways. So I've highlighted it using kind of a heat map and then also using like a rectangle. So the, the network is saying, well, I think this part of the bird looks like this part of that bird. And I've seen that bird before. That's a prototypical clay-colored sparrow. And it's doing all of these visual comparisons. And so the network is saying, well, I think this looks like that, and this looks like that, and this looks like that, and this looks like that. And it's, it's taking these visual comparisons and giving a score for each of them. So every computation that the network is doing is either some kind of visual comparison to part of the image, or it's like some numbers added up. So every part of the computation can be checked by, by a human. And that's how the network actually reasons, right? All the prototypes are learned, and the ways to do these comparisons, it's all learned. And so because the network does this looks like that, and this looks like that, and this looks like that, um, we decided to call the paper this looks like that. And um, so what the, what the paper does is it introduces a technique. And the technique adds a prototype layer to your favorite black box. So you start with your favorite black box, deep neural network. And then you add a prototype layer to it just before the last fully connected layer. And that forces the network to do this kind of case-based reasoning, forces the network to make these compar visual comparisons and make scores for each comparison. And everything is learned during training. The prototypes, everything is learned during training. It's like the same as a regular supervised learning algorithm. It's just that, um, that it's forced to reason in this way so that it makes comparisons. So in other words, you would take your favorite black box deep neural network, and then what you would do is you would add an extra layer just before the last fully connected layer um, that would force it to reason about things using these prototypes. 
And we usually have about 20 prototypes per class and the number of prototypes can be chosen as a parameter by the user. They can choose kind of how many comparisons they wanna make per class. And the network scans the image, just looking for parts of the image that look like each of the prototypes. So I'm gonna show you more detail about this whole part of the, the last part of that computation. I'm gonna write that whole computation out for a particular example. Okay, so here the network is explaining to me why this particular bird is classified as a red-bellied woodpecker. And so it highlighted different parts of the bird, and in particular, it highlighted the bird's bright red head. And so it said, well, me, the network, I think that this bright red head looks like this bird's bright red head. And it's not just the head, it's like this white round, you know, C-shaped thing with this like black thing in the middle. Like the network got really excited about that. And so it gave it a lot of points. So it gives it points for each, each um, comparison that it makes. There's two numbers associated with each comparison. The first number is sort of how much I think this looks like that. And the second number is sort of how important this prototype is for this class. And so it um, computes the product of these two numbers. And then it does this 20 times for all the 20 prototypes for the class and then adds all the scores up and gets a total score for this class. So here the red-bellied woodpecker class um, got 32 points. And it does this for all the classes. And the next highest class got something like um, 16 points. Apparently, so this is for the red cockaded woodpecker class. Apparently red cockaded woodpeckers just don't seem to have the bright red heads that the red-bellied woodpeckers have. And so um, the network tries to get as many points as it can by doing comparisons with the, with the sort of feathers, but it just can't gather as many points as it could before. And sometimes the network, um, um, sometimes the network gets it wrong. So here's a case where the, where the network was wrong and we were trying to figure out what happened. So here, this little bird got misclassified as a, um, a prothonotary warbler instead of a Wilson's warbler. And you can see that it's doing, it's making comparisons, like it's looking at the shape of the eye, you know, the, just the eye and like the, the color on the feathers and stuff, but it just can't get that many points um, as it could for a prothonotary warbler class. And now if I look at the prothonotary warblers, I'm like, hold on a second, that really looks like that bird. <laughs> so it's like, no wonder it got it wrong. Like that really does look like that. Um, but as I mentioned, you can use any base neural network um, to, to do this with. And when we switch the dense, DenseNet 161 base model for a VGG16 model, it actually got it right. And we looked at what it did and we noticed that like, hey, hold on a second, something's going on with this bird. Like this bird um, actually, uh, it's, a, it's clearly avoiding the bird's head. So what I think is happening here is that this little bird is actually maybe a baby, Wilson, a baby Wilson's warbler. And um, it hadn't yet developed this like bright black spot on the top of its head, like the regular, like the other Wilson's warblers. And so the easy way to fix this would be to get more baby Wilson's warblers and stick them in the database. So that's, that's one way to sort of make this more robust. And that's something we learned from, from understanding the way the network was reasoning about the image. Okay, so we've been experimenting with this um, bird data set that we really like. This is the Cub 200 data set. And in this data set, there are 200 classes of birds. And the original black box accuracy is between you know, 74 and 82%. So we just ran a whole bunch of deep neural networks on this data set. And this is the accuracy that, that we've been getting. And um, so we thought, okay, well, you know, this is computer vision, right? This is where the deepest of the deep neural networks were born. And so the question is, how accurate can we get with our proto peanuts? So we said, okay, let's take all the black boxes and then we'll add the prototype layer onto them and make them all interpretable. And what we found is that our accuracy was sort of right in the same range as the black box models. And as it turned out, if we stacked the proto peanuts together, then there's, I mean, they're still using case-based reasoning. They're still reasoning about images in terms of the way parts of the image relate to other images, right? And yet it got accuracy that was better than any of the black boxes. And so we thought, okay. So what we found was that even for like computer vision, right? Even for this domain where people never thought you could create models that were interpretable, we can still have an interpretable model of the same accuracy as a black box. So 
I've really had yet to find um, a domain where I actually need a black box, right? Even for the these, the, the, these domains where the deepest of the deep um, neural networks kind of are tested against each other, um, we're still getting interpretable models that are very accurate. So after we developed this, um, we thought, okay, um, we have this technique, where might we actually use it, right? So we, 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 we proved our point, but what can, what can we do with it? And so we decided that um, we would um, try to apply it to medical imaging. So um, I made some friends in the medical school and they taught me a number of things about computer-aided mammography and, mem and mammography in general. So what they taught me was that Breast cancer is a leading cause of death, not in the USA, but, but in other places too. Also, there are hundreds of thousands of cases diagnosed in the USA each year, causing tens of thousands of deaths each year. Mammography is the hardest task in all of radiology. And in fact, radiologists miss a fifth of breast cancers and half of women getting an annual mammogram over 10 years will have a false positive. And, and, and even, you know, even more, like up to three quarters of biopsies come back as benign. So in other words, these are potentially unnecessary surgeries. So we decided to give this a try. And what we did not want to do was the following. Okay, so what we did not want to do is just take the image of the lesions. There's a, there's a breast lesion right there in the middle of that image. And we just, we didn't want to have um, a neural network just say, oh, like, this is been probably benign, and we're not going to tell you why, right? We didn't want that. And another thing we didn't want to do was to use the um, this like attention only idea where you just sort of highlight the part of the image that the network is looking at. So here, for instance, when we're highlighting, all it does is just highlight the lesion. But like I knew where the lesion was. That's why I sent it into the network in the first place. So this is providing me with absolutely no information that I didn't already have. So what we decided to do was design an, um, an algorithm. It's really a framework. It's called the Interpretable AI Algorithm for Breast Lesions. And what it does is it looks at the image and breaks down the image into different parts and says, well, I think this part of the lesion, well, that part looks kind of like this indistinct margin case that I've seen before. That was in my training set. It's a prototypical indistinct margin. And indistinct margins are bad for the patient. So I'm going to add half a point to the patient's malignancy score because indistinct margins are like more likely to be malignant. Whereas this other part of the lesion, oh, that looks circumscribed. Circumscribed lesions are less likely to be malignant. So I'll subtract something from the malignancy score there. And so it's, it's forced to reason about the image in terms of kind of like the mass margins and the other things that, um, that we want uh, the, the radiologist to, to think about when, when they're analyzing breast lesions. Okay. Um, oh, and by the way, um, when we compare the accuracy of our method to the black box, we again are not losing any accuracy um, as compared to the black box. Okay, um, here's, a, here's an example here of our algorithm kind of in action. I've got a picture of the, uh, I've got the mammogram up on the top, the lesion down in the bottom, and then it's showing you kind of how these explanations are being constructed and where the points are being added and what comparisons it's making and so on. Okay, so, and, and there's the paper in case you wanted to um, take a look at that. All right, so where are black box models more accurate, right? So we typically answer these questions in a couple of different ways in machine learning. We, we were just wondering like, you know, okay, you know, we've looked in all these different places. What, where are black box models more accurate? So the first challenge was interpretable neural networks for computer vision. And as I sh showed you, um, from what we can tell, the interpretable neural network accuracy is very comparable to the black box accuracy in computer vision. So then we thought, okay, well, how else do we do it? Well, we usually do <laughs> really hard benchmark data sets, right? That's another way we compare algorithms against each other. So, okay, let's talk about benchmark data sets. So I'm going to grab the data set from the explainable machine learning challenge, um, which is a data set provided by FICO on um, credit. It's, it's on credit. So it's uh, we're trying to predict whether or not people will repay their loan. And um, this data set has about 10,000 loan applicants and we have like a whole bunch of information about their credit history. Now, uh, we tried a whole bunch of different black box models on this data set and the best black box accuracy we got was around 73%. 
and the best black box AUC is around 0.8. So that's what we want to maintain. Like these are the performance measures that we want to maintain when we go and talk about an interpretable model, right? So as it turns out, um, you know, they told us to create a black box and explain it, but we didn't do that. And neither did the IBM team, which um, got first place. So their uh, model was actually very small. It had only six questions. Now, but they broke, see, the thing is about this, they broke the golden rule of interpretability. They actually lost performance over the best of the black boxes. So their accuracy was about 71.8%, and they lost a ton of AUC. Like, AUC ranges between 0.5 and 1. So to go from 0.8 to 0.62 is, like, really bad. Like, we would never have sent in, um, an entry like that. So what we did instead was we went to the FICO website, and we were wondering, like, okay, since we don't have access to domain experts, <laughs> that you know that makes it really hard to design a model that's that's actually interpretable. So, anyway, since we didn't have access to domain experts, so what 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 do you think they would like? And then when we went on the FICO website, um, all they had was like neural networks, and so we thought, oh, well, they want something that looks like a neural network, and we thought, but you don't need a neural network for tabular data. Like, we we don't think we. We don't need a neural network to get this level of accuracy. So what we did was we designed something that was supposed to look like a neural network, but it was actually a bunch of very tiny little logistic regression models stuck together to make it look like a neural network. <laughs> so our entry, um, which won the FICO recognition prize, we called a two-layer additive risk model to make it look like a neural network, but it was actually just 10 little tiny like little additive models plus one final logistic regression model at the end. Um, to, to put it all back together. And this model actually didn't lose any performance over the black boxes. It was just as accurate as the best of the black boxes. So I'm gonna zoom in a little bit to this model so you can see kind of what some of these subscales look like. Uh, so I'll zoom into the um, subscale in the middle here, which is the delinquency score. And this is, um, as a, it, it's, a, it's a model that uses only four variables. And those variables are things like months since most recent delinquency and months since most recent, you know, trade, you know, whatever, stuff like that. It's all about trades. Okay, so here's um, that model in action, um, scoring a person based on just their delinquency information. And so the percent of trades never delinquent was actually not so good. The person had some delinquent trades, so we give them a few points. Um, the months since most recent delinquency. Oh no, the person had a delinquency in the last eight months, so they get some points for that. So anyway, they got they got some points. We add up the points, and then we add that to a bias term and then send it through that logistic function right there, and we get a risk of defaulting on the loan just based on their their delinquency information. So this person has like a 79.8% chance of defaulting just based on their, their bad delinquency information. So here you can see this is a very sparse additive model. It's a, it's a generalized additive model because it has all these like step functions right there. Okay, so anyway, that's what we created for them. <laughs> and it was, like I said, it got us to the level of accuracy of the best of the black boxes. And so even for these really hard benchmark data sets, we're finding that the interpretable model's accuracy is equal to the black box accuracy. So there's really no scientific evidence that for real problems um, that there's actually an accuracy interpretability trade-off at all, right? You don't really seem to need to sacrifice predictive performance for interpretability as long as you're good at optimization and that you can optimize for interpretability um, in addition to optimizing for accuracy. So that's why, um, you know, that's why we, you know, we were able to get kind of this, this level of performance. Um, and I, I want to point out that, um, so something funny kind of happened like while we were doing this. So we sent in, we sent in the, um, you know, we had this, this, nice, this nice website where they acknowledged that our contribution and we did this transparent global model and user-friendly dashboard that they, 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 they like this. And so they, so we thought, okay, we're excited about this. So let's send our, let's write a paper. Okay, let's write a paper and send it into, it's a special issue for a journal. And I was told to email the editor of the special issue before we sent it into the journal. So I wrote, um, I wrote to the editor. I said, um, "Dear, fancy esteemed professor at fancy esteemed university, 
I said, we have this, um, we wrote this paper on this data set. You don't need a black box for this data set. You know, they, we thought the, the competition organizers told us we needed a black box for it, but we actually didn't. Uh, and um, the paper is is not, you know, we didn't know whether, we don't know whether our paper fits into the scope of the special issue. It's not a traditional methodology paper. Its contribution is an analysis of this FICO data set, including a machine learning model that is interpretable. Um, and the content actually won this, this nice award. And, and so can you please allow us to submit the paper to the special issue? And he wrote me an email back and he said, Dear Cynthia, thanks for reaching out. This is an interesting paper, but I'm afraid it's not a good fit for the special issue. It's also related to my own recent work on explainability of neural nets. Is the FICO data still available? And if so, could you share it? And I was like, oh my gosh, like this is unbelievable, right? I send the guy a paper saying, you don't need a black box for this data set. We've got a very simple model that is really accurate for this data set. And he sends me back an email saying, I don't care about your work, but can you send me the data so I can create a black box and explain it? I was like, oh my gosh, you know, just sometimes people just don't get it. And that's uh, unfortunately the state of where things have been for the last several years in machine learning. Everybody just really likes explaining black boxes. So I finally got sick of um, listening to this nonsense. And I finally just wrote a paper that was called Stop Explaining Black Box Machine Learning Models for High Stakes Decisions and Use Interpretable Models Instead. And it had please in the title earlier. It was like, please stop explaining. And they made me take out the please so that it sounded more commanding, like just stop doing this. And I gave a lot of reasons why we should stop doing this. And um, I'll just tell you some of them. Um, and the first one is that black box models still force you to trust the data set, even though, even when you explain them. Also, and, and data sets are no, I mean, I've never met a clean data set in my life, right? Data is just really, really noisy. It's really hard to know whether you should trust a black box um, because it's based on, like I said, often very noisy data. And then there's also this problem called double trouble. Double trouble is where you have to rely on two models instead of one. So here are the black box and the explanation. And if either one of those fails, then you, then you cannot trust the predictions. So for instance, if you have like easy cases, well, the easy cases, to be honest, you generally don't really need any kind of model for it, or you could create an interpretable model for the easy cases. It's the hard cases that cause the problem. And those are exactly the cases where the explanation methods tend to fail. So in the cases you really care about, um, that's where the explanations actually don't work. And so that's where you then why bother? Why did you do the whole thing in the first place? Because you're not going to get explanations for the cases you care about. So also the explanation has to disagree with the black box. Because if they didn't, then you could simply throw out the black box and just use the explanation model as an inherently interpretable model. So they have to disagree with each other. So then the question becomes, well, how often do they disagree with each other? Because if they if they're, if you have an explanation that's right 90% of the time, most people think that's good, but that, that means that that explanation model is wrong 10% of the time. So that means 10% of the time you cannot trust your explanations and therefore you can't trust the predictions, right? You're just stuck 10% of the time. And like I said, that's usually an important 10%. All right. We have other issues, like the explanations are often not really explanations, right? They often don't even use the same variables. And an example that I give in the paper is on the compass score. So there was a, a, a scandal several years ago where the ProPublica group accused the compass model of depending on race. They said that the model depended on age, criminal history, and race. But their analysis was actually wrong. They, um, they actually took compass and created an approximation to compass that potentially depended on race. But that doesn't mean the underlying model depends also on race. So I go into a lot of detail um, on this on this particular case because it's exactly um, a situation where the, um, the explanation where, where somebody used an explanation model and then made a conclusion about the black box from the explanation model. That, was, um, that seems to be incorrect. And then I think the most important argument in the paper is that, you know, if you can produce an interpretable model, why should you explain a black box? 
do you really want to extend the authority of the black box? Or can you actually, you know, produce an interpretable model, right? If you, if you, extending the authority of the black box just makes the whole problem worse. And for all the reasons that I just told you and for high stakes decisions, you really don't want to extend that authority. All right, so here um, are the papers that I, uh, that I've discussed. So the please stop explaining paper up in the corner there. The next paper down is um, a review paper that we wrote on interpretable machine learning. And it's actually a technical paper. So if you're a student and you're thinking about what you might want to work on and you think you might want to work on interpretable machine learning, we've got a whole bunch of different problems that you could work on listed in there and a bunch of unsolved problems listed there too. And then the next two papers, learning optimized risk scores, and then the paper below that are for the two helps to be score. It's the method that we use to derive the two helps to be score, and then the paper that introduces that score. And then um, the paper at the bottom is our latest paper on optimal sparse um, decision trees. And um, we've been able to construct like very tiny little decision trees, even for the FICO data set, we've been able to get a decision tree that's as accurate as the best of the black boxes that uses only 10 leaves. Um, so that's that's really quite, and, and we were able to do it in less than 10 seconds. So um, that's the state of where things are with decision trees. And then the two papers on the right are um, the, the, paper, the papers on interpretable neural networks and the application to digital mammography. All right, so that's it for me, and thank you very much. OK. So thank you, Cynthia. Uh, this is really an inspiring conference. Uh, we receive a number of questions that I would like to share if you, uh, if you agree. Sure. So one of the first questions we receive is related to the team of the conference. So when we look at all the projects uh, you worked on, it seems obvious that you found a way to collaborate with people having expertise in other domains. If you had one advice for young researchers that would like to kind of follow uh, your path and successfully collaborate on multidisciplinary projects, what would it be and why? Um, yeah, so I definitely encourage people to go work with others. Um, so make some friends, <laughs> go make some friends. And, and you know, um, ho hopefully you can find a friend with data. <laughs> Right, so you want you probably want to ask around, find somebody with data that, who who has an idea, um, and I mean, obviously you want to work with with, you know, if, if you're a student, right, you want to work with your advisor, you want to work with somebody who does interdisciplinary collaborations, because if you don't work with someone who does this kind of collaborations, it's really hard, maybe for them to get started, or maybe they don't want to do that. But if you find someone you can work with who's used to doing these kind of collaborations, then you can you should be able to get right into this and find a, a good problem. Um, but I, I definitely encourage people to work on applications. I think it's really important. Um, you know, I, I got into this field because I was working on trying to maintain the New York City power grid. And um, I, I learned very, very quickly that a black box approach was not going to work because the data set was so noisy that I wasn't getting any benefit from more complicated machine learning algorithms. And the really the major benefit I was getting um, was by talking to domain experts and showing them our interpretable models and getting them to give us feedback. Um, so that's how I that's how I learned that's how I went into my field was doing applicate doing real world applications. So I would I would strongly encourage people to do that. Uh, the second question is also related to your career path. So uh, in the past, you worked on different projects in healthcare, justice, energy, uh, and different sectors. Is there one of these projects that you are particularly proud of? And if yes, what is so special about it? Um, okay, so one that I haven't mentioned. So I've mentioned the energy grid stuff. I've talked about healthcare because I talked about the two helps to be score and the mammography stuff. But one application I haven't mentioned is the um, collaboration that I've done, done with police officers. So um, 
I worked with police officers in Cambridge, Massachusetts to find patterns of crimes that were committed by the same people. Um, so these are crime, this is crime series analysis. So every time a new crime happens, like a new housebreak, the police have got a very difficult job to do. They have to compare that new housebreak with all of the other housebreaks in the data set to see whether there's a pattern going on. And if there is, they can do things that they can do things like try to figure out where these people are going to break in next, or they can try to attribute which crimes were committed by which people. Um, and um, I, we wrote a piece of code uh, with them that we posted on the internet. And then um, the year after we posted it online, the, a very bright data scientist from the New York Police Department took that piece of code and implemented it at the New York Police Department. And it's been running for um, since, I think, the last five years. Um, they've, it's been running in New York City. And it uh, links new crimes to um, crimes that have happened before in New York so that it can that they can identify whether um, a crime, new crime is part of a series. Wow. Uh <laughs> This is uh, impressive. So, so I guess it's, it, it was not the, you didn't use a pushed approach, but a pulled approach, right? Someone was interested by your work and then uh, you got buy-in from them, I guess, to, to make it uh, something like a, a, reality, a real application. Yeah, well, it was interesting. I mean, at some point, I was sitting there, uh, and you know, I was, I was, I sent, I got an email that said, "Would you like to meet some police officers from the Cambridge Police Department?" And so I went into this meeting, and they get these big guys with their guns, you know, walk into this room, and you know, <clears throat> just kind of like, oh, oh. <laughs> um, and then there were all these like very senior faculty members sitting there, and they went around the room and said, "Does any, does anyone want to work with the police?" And one by one, the senior faculty members were like, "Well, I don't, I don't want." To, to work with the police, but I'll supervise. And I was like, I'll do it, you know, like, I'll, I'll go work with you. So uh, that's how I got in, into that. And I became very good friends with the um, the police officer that I was collaborating with. He ended up being, you know, very, very smart. At the time, he, um, he didn't have a college degree. And he was sending me like papers, to, like academic papers to read. And he's like, I don't think this technique is the right one for our, for our thing. And I'm like, how did you read this paper? I thought he had a graduate degree. And it turned out he hadn't, you know, finished college, and he turned out to be like a genius, basically. So um, now he has a degree from Harvard, so he's good. But um, it, it was just like kind of a, a really interesting kind of uh, uh, situation that I was in. And, um, yeah, yeah, it, it worked out really well. Do you know if it's used by other uh, police department, other cities? I don't, I don't know if it's used by other police departments. I'm not sure. I mean, it's very hard to do that kind of research nowadays because uh, after a couple of years ago, nobody can get police data. Like they've they've sort of put a stop on people working with police, um, and um, I think that's really a shame. I really do think that um, that academics could do a lot of good working with police officers. So now I've been working on other types of criminal justice applications, like risk scoring and trying to prove that we don't need um, models like Compass, which is proprietary, uh, and just trying to warn people about the risks of using black box models for some of these these criminal justice applications. So I guess this is the last question that uh, I have. I want to uh, personally thank you for your conference. This was really inspiring. Um, before we part away, uh, this was a, an half of a day that was full of uh, people that uh, participate to make it a success. So I want to recognize the fact that uh, this conference uh, benefited from the support of many presenters, panelists, organizers that truly believe in the team of this conference. This conference would have not been possible without the strong support of people that have different backgrounds and skills. Thanks everyone who contributed to make it a uh, successful event. And on that note, uh, I thank you for your participation and uh, stay safe. And thank you again, Professor Rudin, for the great conference. Thank you.